If you have your Bibles, if you could turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, read from verse 17 through to verse 20. Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 17. This is the word of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us. We might become the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, like yourselves, I am just a sinner saved by grace. And it is thanks to Calvary and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, that I no longer walk the road of sin, rebellion, and disobedience, and death that I once walked. And when and where I go back to that road uh, this evening, I do so not to glory in a dark, shameful past, but to simply show you how by God's grace I am where I am today. Um, I come originally from East Belfast in Northern Ireland, for those of you who would be interested, um, famous for the Titanic. I was perfectly okay when I left Belfast. Uh, also famous for C.S. Lewis, for those of you who are culturally, culturally refined, Van Morrison come from East Belfast. Gary, the late Gary Moore, uh, rock guitarist, uh, George Best, uh, played for Man United. Those of you who really in your football, David McCreary, who played for Man United. Um, I went to school with David. We were in primary school together, played football with him. And uh, for those of you who are rude. But um, it was into that part of East Belfast where I was born in the 1950s. Mum and dad, older sister, 
older brother, myself, and then a younger sister. And it was a very loving, very happy, very uh, secure home. Jeff in his book remembers his mum going about the house cleaning and singing gospel hymns. Well, I remember my mum going about the house cleaning and she would sing country songs. And a bit of a love for country music today. I mean, listen to my mum singing country songs as she cleaned. Um, but that happy home um, became uh, a sad home in 1970, just at the outbreak of the Troubles as it became known in Northern Ireland. Uh, Saturday, the 27th of June, 1970, 52 years ago, and Monday week, and it's like yesterday. Um, my mum came up uh, that Saturday morning. She woke me up and asked if I would like to go for a walk with my dad, who was going um, for a morning walk, and she said we'd like to join him. And I got up and went went with him on on this walk. Um, we spent the the whole morning together and the uh, early part of the afternoon and pulled so many many precious memories for myself and yet at the same time very sad memories because that night just as the troubles were starting to escalate in the province um, the dad was shot dead by the, the IRA I was around about half eleven that night I was out in the street waiting on my dad coming home it was a, it was a night as warm as this and then um, there was a blast of automatic gunfire. A little that I know that was my dad being killed. And the gunfire continued right through the whole night, didn't, didn't stop. And then um, I was pulled into a neighbor's house. As I was sitting in the neighbor's house, and um, people were coming and going. I was sitting on an armchair with my, with my eyes closed. They thought I was sleeping. And as people were coming in, and going out, there was hushed whispers. It's terrible. It's awful. Uh, does he know? And then um, I remember getting up and saying, What's awful? What's terrible? And my friend's dad stepped out and grabbed me. And uh, I was saying, Where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? And he said, Billy, your daddy's not coming home. Your daddy's dead. And I, I remember distinctly saying to him, well, this is God's will. And he grabbed me by the shoulders and he literally, he nearly shook the life out of me. And he said, there is no God. And he used an expletive and he referred to the Roman Catholic community across the road and he said, it's them across there. Never you forget that there is no God. And so at the age of 12, basically I wrote God out of my life. Because if there was a God who was all powerful and all loving, he could have stopped the pain that had just entered into our lives. The, the time of the shooting, my mother was three months pregnant. And six months later to the day, my kid brother was born. And the, the darkness that entered the home um, it was like a cancer, as was the hate and the bitterness. It just grew. There was an insatiable longing for revenge. And I still remember my young brother running in off the street when he was around three or so, three or four, running in off the street, running up to my mum and asking what a daddy was. How come his friends in the, in the street had a daddy to talk about and he hadn't? Where was his dad? And to see my mum break down in tears trying to explain why there was no father figure in the home. So seeds of hatred and bitterness to a greater degree and greater extent. And come 1974, I joined the Loyalist Paramilitary Organization, a Loyalist Terrorist Group. And I don't need to go into any more details about what terrorists got up to. Sadly, we live in a world where we're all too familiar with terrorist activity. Um, my family were supportive of me going into that group. Uh, my older brother was also involved in the terrorist organization. Uh, that was our reaction to the death that had come to our door as a result of terrorism. I, I know there are many families touched as a result of the violence. My 
her mum often said, were it not for the fact that she had a little baby to look after, she would have been involved in terrorism. After my dad was killed, uh, she stopped singing. She said she had nothing to sing about. And so there was this longing for revenge. And I remember the night I joined the terrorist group and went into the bar where this group met. And then um, the commander of this little unit came up and he said, there were three of us joined that night. And he said, um, what do you want to do? And I said, well, the only thing I want to do is kill. And he, la he laughed and he made a gesture with his hand like that to about maybe 50 or 60 young lads behind him. And he said, you just got to wait your turn. And that's what I find frustrating, that I, I was in a queue. Um, I trained in bomb making simply because you can kill more people with a bomb than you can with a gun. And uh, come 1975, it was myself and the young lad that we joined together. We were approached and asked if we would carry out a shooting, an IRA man, and uh, we were game, yeah, we will do that. And uh, we were told to be on standby. But the uh, it didn't come off. And uh, February 76, we were approached again, and we were told the shooting was back on. But we still game to do it. Yeah, of course we are. I said, there's two things we need to explain. One, it's not an IRA man. He's actually a member of our own organization. He's a fellow in the VF man. But he was an informer. And uh, if we didn't want to do the shooting because he was one of our own, they would understand it. We'd get somebody else to do the shooting. But no, we know the rules. If you inform, it's an immediate death sentence. So if this guy was an informer, then he had to be taken out. The other thing they said was, we only need one of you to do the shooting because it's a punishment shooting, the Provost Marshal's going to do it, so it can only be one of us. And me and the mate then start arguing about who was going to be the one to do this shooting. And uh, the guy, the commander of the organization, pulled a, a coin out of his pocket, he tossed it. I think I called heads or whatever, 33. The lot is cost, the coin is cost if you like, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And I go out February uh, the 19th, 1976, very early in the morning, along with an accomplice in a derelict street in Belfast, and very coldly, without any mercy, without any kind of conscience, very brutally, luckily, uh, take the life of another human being that was created in God's image. But as far as I was concerned, I had now proven myself within the organization of going to go on a killing spree. And uh, I was arrested within a space of two weeks by the grace of God and found myself in a maze prison. The young lad who lost the, the toss, a year later he was blown up by his own bomb in Corporation Street in Belfast. I often wonder if um, if he had called the right call and done the shooting, would it have been would it have been me brushed off the streets of Belfast that night and put in a plastic bag and then a box. So I was arrested find myself in a maze prison. I was either going to go to prison for a very long time or end up dead. When I was in prison, um, carried on, you know, uh, the interest in terrorism, red hooks in terrorism, all to come out a better educated terrorist. Um, started to study politics, get into communism, I believe that uh, communism would have been the answer for Ireland. The last thing Ireland needed was the Bible, you know. Religion's Ireland's problem. So uh, what does Ireland need? Ireland needs Mr. Marx. And I studied, you know, for years, Marxism. I was uh, sentenced 
1977, was too young to be given a life sentence. So it was uh, detained under the Secretary of State's pleasure. Province, emanating from the H blocks were the Republican protests. There was the blanket protests where the, they just sat with a blanket wrapped around them. And then it escalated to the dirty protests where they were smearing their excrement around the cell walls. And then finally to the hunger strike. So all of that comes from the H blocks. So as in the H blocks, having been sentenced to what amounted to a life sentence. It was only there a matter of weeks when um, a fellow prisoner arrived called Peter Thompson. Now Peter and myself were on remand, I knew him well. But when Peter arrived in the H blocks after having been sentenced, he was, uh, he was carrying one of these, he was carrying the Bible, and he was talking about Jesus, which I thought was very convenient because he's just been given a life sentence. He wants to get out of prison early. Why is he going to get out of prison early? Well, show the authorities that he's now a good guy. He's carrying a Bible instead of a bomb. But uh, as far as I was concerned, Peter was a hypocrite, he was a phony, couldn't face up to the prices of the penal system. He needed a crutch to lean on, and this is a really convenient crutch. Now, Peter, when he arrived in the H blocks, appointed himself a block barber. So you needed a haircut to have to send for Peter. And when Peter started to cut your hair, he had a really novel approach to evangelism. He used to get the scissors and he would put them into the side of your neck and he would be a plant, quite a bit of pressure, right? <laughs> and he would just, then he would say, right, just another little, little bit of pressure and I'm into your juggler. And you're lying here in a pool of blood and by the time they get a medic down here, to stem the flow of blood, you're dead and you're in hell because you're not a Christian. Now what about that for evangelism? <laughs> and see if you have good comment and you just wanted, you know, to get the hair cut, you say, Peter, would you, would you just give over and cut my hair like that? But, you know, that, that was Peter's approach to, to evangelism. Now you see around about 1978, letters arrived, okay? Um, one of the, some of the letters, one um, was always asking my mum how I was doing, and she said, would Billy mind if I wrote to him? And in uh, 1978, she started to write to him, and she wrote every day. And she started to visit, and she visited every week. That was one of the letter, part of the letters that came, but also around this time, there were letters that arrived from New Zealand. They came in a long brown envelope. And I remember pulling the contents out of this envelope. And I caught the name of Jesus somewhere in the corner. And I put it back inside the envelope, curled it up in the ball and threw it in the waste paper bin. I had absolutely no time for God. I had no time for religion. Six or eight weeks later, another one of these magazines, Postmark New Zealand, Stamp New Zealand, handwritten address to myself in its block seven of the Mays prison. I know what's inside it, it's one of these religious magazines and it goes into the bin. My friends, see to this day, I do not know anybody in New Zealand. That, that's just how it is. Um, and they're, they're coming every six or eight weeks and throwing them in the bin. Peter Thompson still running about the place with his novel approach to evangelism. And I think, well, if Peter's into this religious, carry on. Instead of these magazines going in the bin, I'll give them to Peter. And that's exactly what it did. As soon as the magazines reached myself, I knew where they were from, I knew what was inside it, give it back to the prison officer and said, give that to Peter Thompson. August of 1980, I go out to the medical room one night at a blinding headache. Who was in the medical room but Peter Thompson? And I happened to say to Peter, I hope you're getting the magazines that I'm sending across to you. I don't know who's sending them, Peter, but you're quite welcome to them. And even before Peter could answer, the medical officer looked up and he said, oh, do you not think it's God sending you these magazines? And I thought of a right one here. You know, God sending magazines from New Zealand <laughs> to the nearest prison. 
And I said to this medical officer, look, I'm pretty skeptical about God. I do not believe that God exists. Nine out of ten times, if I'd have said to a Christian, I'm skeptical about God, I don't believe God exists, they would come back at me with Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said, take tablets and get off sight. He looks at me. And he says, you're skeptical about God. And I said, that's right. You don't believe God exists. And I said, that's right. Only call me a fool, because you can read these Christians like a book. And he looked at me and he said, well, I want to tell you something, kid. Regardless of whether you believe in God or not, doesn't take away the fact that there is a God. Nor does it take away the fact that if you die, in the state that you're in at the moment, you're going straight to hell. And once you get there, kid, you're not going to be skeptical anymore. He says, in fact, everybody in that place believes. He said, the tragedy of it is this, that once you are there, there is no release date. You're there forever. I couldn't hit him with a line of argument for, you know, the fool who said in his heart there was no God. He had wrong food of him, and I turned and I hightailed it out of that medical way. As I thought about it, if it's a heaven and a hell, no argument. I know where I'm going, but is there a heaven and a hell? Is there a God? What religion is right? You know, I could go on the rest of the night about the amount of religions in this world. And here I am in this prison encountering these Christian prison officers and some of these Christians who have become Christians. And you know what's really annoying about them is their dogmatism and their arrogance. You know, their, their, their Bible is the only Bible. Their way is the only way. Their Jesus is the only Jesus. Nobody else gets a look in. And I'm asking all sorts of questions following this in conversation with the uh, medical officer in the medical room. And what a kind of inadequate explanation for, even up to the present day, those magazines that have been coming on a regular basis every six or eight weeks since 1978, never received another one. I never read one of them, and I never received one, another one. It's as freaky as that, but that's just how it happened. Christmas Eve 1980, a woman came down in a cell, a woman called Gladys Blackburn, and she was standing up here behind this puppy you wouldn't see her, she was so small. She was a retired school teacher. Comes down to the cell, Christmas Eve 1980, after a bit of formal conversation, she lifts down the Bible, starts to read from Luke chapter 23, and a superscript saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering your book him saying, Do you not spare God, seeing we are in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm -hmm. And she stopped at that first. She said, I want you to think who Jesus Christ is calling Lord. I want you to think who this thief is calling Lord. And she began to, to describe what Jesus Christ must have looked like on the cross. Um, she held up her three fingers. Uh, she had a cyst on her finger. And she was saying, you know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his, his, his sin, uh, his blood covered our sin. And uh, that says that's on my finger, you can't see it anymore because Jesus Christ has covered it. And she was giving these little pictures of, um, you know, what Jesus was doing on the cross. But what was, what was going on in my own thinking, in my own heart, as she was explaining that was... For the first time in my life, I felt an overwhelming sense of guilt. I never felt, I never felt guilty before. If you had met me in prison and said, Billy, were you justified in taking the life of another human being? See, in a warped way, I would have justified my decision. And you'd have thought, you know, that guy's a few marbles loose, and you're looking right, Mike. But I would have been thinking that I was perfectly logical and explaining that I was justified. And taking the life of another individual. But that night I realized no justification for what I had done. I was a sinner and I was under God's condemnation and yes I deserved hell and it was real. I realized that Jesus Christ on the cross, he who knew no sin, he who was innocent, was taking the rap for me. He was taking my punishment and it was clear as that. And that woman uh, she, she was reading a few verses of scripture. I remember her reading 
John 6, 37, all that the Father give to me will come to me. He who comes unto me, I will never turn away. And she got up and left the cell. That night, Christmas Eve, 1980, got down on my knees on the cell, H block 7 of the maze prison, and I threw a waste of life before God. I repented of my sin. Um, she'd left a little gospel tract, and I think it was a, a, a sinner's prayer in the back of the tract. It was probably, well, this doesn't work. And then I remembered the first, John 6, 37, if you come to Jesus, he will not turn you away. And I said, right, I've come, and I believe he will never turn me away. And there was no flashes of lightning, claps of thunder, funny mystical experience. It was a simple prayer of faith, and God heard it. I guess if there was anything subjective, I felt, I felt clean. And all the hate and all the bitterness, and all the anger and rage that characterized my life, it, it went like that. You know, she, uh, the woman had said that when you become a Christian, you've got to confess it to others. And that was a sticking point because I knew what I thought of Peter Thompson. And I knew what people said about Christians. But how was, how was I going to go out on Christmas morning and tell people that I was a Christian? Well, see, in the, the cell next door to me, there's a guy called Michael McGee, and we called him Shirley. We called him Shirley because he was gossip. You know, women are always gossiping, like, I know this isn't PC. But I knew if I told Shirley McGee in the next cell that he would kill everybody in the wing for me. And then, uh, <laughs> Christmas morning, big guy, big prison officer, big sheet as he open, opens my, my door, and I follow him to the next door where Shirley is, and he opens the door and I shout out, I became a Christian last night, and run back into my own cell, and right enough, through the form, Shirley told everybody in the wing for me <laughs> that I was a Christian. My hand well, it's a cop out. But that's how I ended up letting everybody know I was a Christian. <laughs> now, obviously, I rode out to family and friends and told them about this great change that had come into my life. What was the reaction of my family? My sister said, well, anything is better than communism. And the Christian bit is the next little sort of thing that he's going to be into. My mum was generally happy that I was a Christian. but. I'll come back to this in a second. The girl who was writing to me, who came every day in 78, visited me every week. The very first visit, I go into the visiting room and she's sitting and she's crying her eyes out. And she's saying, she's saying she says, we, we will never be able to work. What do you mean? What, what are you talking about? She says, it says in the Bible, you cannot be unequally yoked with a non-believer. I know what you're talking about. She says, I'm a, you're a Christian, I'm not. I will never be a Christian. The Bible says we are unequally yoked, we cannot be together. I said, the Bible doesn't say that. And she says, it's 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. You go and read it. And I go back to my cell and read it, and right enough, there it is in black and white. So what do I do? I start with the protocols. That doesn't mean what it means. Okay, now my mum, um, she uh, wrote a letter a few weeks after I became a Christian. In it she was saying, how could I talk about a God of love? How could I talk about a God of forgiveness? Where is this great God of love, this great God of forgiveness? The night your dad was gone down in the street like a dog by those IRA scum and she had underlined it three times. And she shared in the letter how she'd met her my dad after he came out of the forces in the Second World War. All their plans, all their hopes, all their dreams for the future, and how it all had all been shattered that night in June 70. And as a time and I wrote her, her letter based in Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And I sent a covering letter to my younger sister who was a Christian that professing faith and going to church. And I said, well, you got to get my mom. you got to get her to church with you. And letters come back and forward. But um, it was a few weeks later, I got a letter from my mom. I still got two letters today. And she opened it. And this is, this is what, how she opened it. I now know what you mean about God's forgiveness. 
Tonight in church, I became a Christian. And when I saw my mom say it, I saw a mountain move, the mountain of hatred and bitterness that had accumulated over 10 years. And you see, when she was saved, she started singing again because God puts the song back into the life. And she's 94, and she's still singing God's praise. And, you know, God, that's the God we worship, that's the God we adore, the God who moves mountains. And another couple of lads in the wing became Christians, and they said, Billy, you're, you've got three weeks more knowledge in us. Teach us everything that you've, you've learned in three weeks. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up beginning, you know, teaching a bit of the Bible. But everything was taught in those early days. Most of the prison officers were brethren guys. So it was a uh, spoon fed dispensationalism for years uh, before I eventually came to the Reformed faith uh, through the influence of some other prison officers. But then, um, you know, just reading the Bible and the Bible saying you've got to be baptized. You know, we said, well, we've got to be baptized if the Bible says it. And four of us who were professing faith went down into, you know, the, the sort of the shower area, filled up the bath with water, and we baptized each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and to make sure that we were fully submerged, we had about half a dozen mop buckets, and when we baptized each other, even the water spills over. The other two was pouring the water on to make sure it was completely covered. <laughs> and all the water was all over the place and went down the wing. And uh, when you get four guys in a bath, and raise the suspicions in this prison up there, come over and say, what are you doing? He said, we're baptizing each other because the Bible tells us to do it. And he says, well, I don't think that's allowed. <laughs> but the Bible says about it's allowed or not. <laughs> so, yeah, now you see, as I look back, I think it was a wee bit impetuous, I think we should have waited. It might mean until I got out and got baptized with, in the church. But when I got out, out of Fansley and explained to the elders of the church what had happened, they said, yeah, well, as long as it was by immersion, it's a public baptism. So uh, you, you can challenge me in that later if you like. But the girl's still writing, still visiting. She come up about the year after I'd become a Christian. And she said, right, this isn't going to work. It's either, and it's just what she said. She said, I will do anything for you, anything. She said, I, I, I will wait. I don't care how long you're in. I will wait. We will get, till you get out, we'll get married. I'll do anything for you. But you gotta, you gotta check in Christianity. You got to leave Christianity. Kind of, you go back from a visit, you're always happy, but boy, the, my mate saw me coming in, he says, what's wrong? And I said, just give me a choice, Christ or, Christ or her. And uh, he turned around, he said to the other lads, you know, this is what you said. And one of them said, that's Satan, you know. I know that these guys were Christian. And I went down to myself, and it was very nearly her. And you know what made the difference? There was a, I had a hymn book for myself. And I'm thinking, it's going to be the girl. And yeah, she's been writing to me every day since 1978, visiting me every week. And I lifted the hymn book, and it just fell open at when I surveyed the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And that last verse, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, command my soul, my life, my all. And then, I remember saying, Lord, if she's going to go, make it as painless as possible. And then she went, and he didn't make it as painless as possible. It would take me long to explain what happened. But then, um, you know, during the, just this, to fill in a couple of things for you, you know, during the whole hunger strike scenario, um, Rome's involvement in that, it's horrendous, you know. 
the wee woman who came down to my cell uh, and witnessed to me, she went around every part of that prison witnessing. She went to the hunger strikers and witnessed to them. And there was one of them she witnessed to. And uh, she gave a little illustration about, you know, the three fingers, Christ and the middle cross, this one here recognized his sin, the, the, the cyst, but Christ covered the sin. And the prison officer, when he died in hunger strike, the prison officer was talking to Gladys and, she, and he said, you know, Gladys, when we went in, when he had died, and Gladys was saying, I wonder if he was sending me a message that of accepted Christ. We don't know. But she wondered. There was a girl coming up to see one of the hunger strikers. And um, it's like the girl that's coming up to see me, you know, I'll be on any for you, I just want to marry you. I don't want you dead. She was saying that to him every day. You've got to come off this hunger strike. I want you alive, I don't want you dead. And she took she took them off it. And she came out of the ward. She said to the prison officer, he told me this. She said, get a priest, get a priest. He is coming off the hunger strike. If he had to come off the hunger strike, the hunger strike would have been broken. Get a priest, get a priest. He's coming off. Sin says it's not a priest you need. It's a doctor. And Sid flies down the wing across to the other side of the hospital, gets a doctor, running back with a doctor, going down the wing, a priest from Anderson's time, you can Google his name, Father Toner, had that young girl by the throat up against the wall, saying, he's staying on the hunger strike, he's not coming off, this is bigger than you. That young lad died on hunger strike. Rome's involvement in that whole episode is deplorable. I was released from prison in 1985, relatively short space of time for the seriousness of the crime that I was involved in. The following year, I went to the Irish Baptist College and studied for the ministry. Was while at the Irish Baptist College, I met my wife Roberta, and then I got a second life sentence. We married in 1989. God's good, isn't it? I see brings things together. But see, when I was in college, I'll finish with this. When I was in college, doing my student assistantship in the area where I grew up, the church where I did my assistantship was on the corner of the street where my dad was killed. And it was about November, really, really cold. We were doing door-to-door -door work in the area. And we go to this house, we're at the door, and this old man comes to the door, and he, and he felt the icy blast, and he invited us into the house. So we go into the house, we're sitting down, we're chatting, and all of a sudden he starts to point to all of these different photographs in, in the living room. And then he turns and he points to a photograph beside him, it was in a lovely gilded frame of a young man, probably in his early 20s, an old black and white photograph. And he points to it and he said, and this one, he said, and this one's my brother. And still looking at the photograph, he said, you know, they shot him dead. And I said, who shot him dead? And still looking at the photograph, he says, the IRA shot him dead in 1935. He was walking home one night and they just opened up and they shot him dead. And I said to him, well, tell me this, how, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about it now? And this is 53 years after the offense. And he turned around and he looked at us and he said, look, I know you two men are from the church and I don't want to offend you. But he says, I can tell you, I still hate them. When you could feel the hate, 
You could feel it as it came out of him. 53 years after the event. And I said to him, well, I know what you're talking about. Because I was once acquainted with that here. I knew. I know the insatiable longing for revenge. And I also know the peace and the joy and the forgiveness that comes through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one who can take away that mountain of hate, that cancer of hate. He's the only one who can come into a life that has been ruined and broken and put it back together again. And you know when I get up that Monday morning, I will go through every step of the day that I had with my dad, it was 53 years ago. That you know, the pain doesn't go away. The questions don't go away. The heartache is still as raw as it was 53 years ago. And you see, were it not for the fact that Christ came in to my life, I would, be, I would have been working that hatred out in a way that would have been detrimental to the rest of society. I would have been engaged in the, in the taking of life. But you see, Christ makes a difference. Christ comes in to the heart and changes it. And he gives you a reason for living. And he gives you this wonderful gospel to preach. Gospel of reconciliation. That sinful men can be reconciled to a holy and a righteous God. And we can sing glorious hymns like the hymn we sang at the, the start of the service. You know, thank God for Calvary. Because of Calvary, I no longer walk the roads that I once walked. And the next time that we'll sing in loving kindness, Jesus came. I know some people get some hang ups over that because of the first and I on a higher plane, I dwell because it comes from the holy you know, the holiness movement. But friends, when you see when you you've been dug from a pit and set upon the rock, Christ Jesus. I on a higher plane I dwell, and with my soul, I know it's well. Why? Because in loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy, to reclaim. Thank you, Amen. 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 Amen, brother. Thank you very much. Do you know, as Billy was, was testifying there, the words of, will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor devilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Yeah. But you were washed. Amen. Praise God for his washing, boy. Amen. Praise God for his washing. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, stand together to sing that hymn that Billy uh, quoted. All, all the hymns have been picked by the four speakers. Um, so they have, in loving kindness, Jesus came. And, and then we'll have a word of prayer and then uh, we'll take a, a half hour break for Please be back to show up so we can get started. So we're not delaying uh, in other conference this evening. So let's stand together as we worship God. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, folks, half past eight, have a wee break. Coffee addicts, go get your fix again. And uh, as I say, back here for half past eight to start our final session for the day. Thank you. Thank you.